Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your support of the show. If you'd like to support the show, go to jeffersonhour.com and click on donate. While you're there, you can read about this episode, past episodes, and you can also find out about Clay's upcoming cultural tours, his new book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How'd I do with that, Clay? Very well, thank you. It's great to have Joe Ellis back on the program. He's been gone for a few weeks. He's been traveling mostly virtually to promote and represent his new book, The Cause. Uh, he got us uh, advanced copies. Uh, it's an extraordinary book, kind of a summing up. Although he says he should have written the book 30 years ago as the foundation of all that followed. But, you know, he's, he's, he's essentially exhausted the subject of the founding generation. The only person he has not really written about, and I've urged him to do so, is Aaron Burr. And he says he just doesn't have it in him to try to sort out the whatever that was that was going on when Burr tried to uh, break up the Union beginning in 1806 in the Mississippi Valley. But, you know, Joe Ellis is a, a man of extraordinary talent. He's one of the handful, five or ten most important historians in America uh, of that era, um, he's, for whatever reason, he's given us a lot of his uh, attention. It's a gift, um, and we take as much as we can have of, of his insights. And I thought he was particularly spot on today with his discussion of the background uh, to the 4th of July. I agree. It is a gift that he has bestowed upon us, uh, sharing his time and his, his insights. It's made for a lot of very interesting conversations on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. There's a lot of agreement and some disagreement, but there's a kind of a, a little republic of letters, a little kind of harmonious little community that we've created for ourselves and, and, and listeners to the Thomas Jefferson Hour where we're old friends now, and the old friends talk about things in a way that has that's less formal and maybe in some ways more insightful than earlier on when we were more maybe f likely to be formal in our approach. Maybe I'm not sure about that, but it, it is it is it, it has a tendency to fall into just conversation between the three of us. I'm just glad to tag along. I enjoy it so much. Well, Joe is somebody who's really earned it. You know, uh, he's won all the major prizes. You know, this is this is a story that everybody knows. That you know, you learn this in in grade school. Uh, that uh, things went wrong between us and Britain. Uh, then there was uh, you know, Lexington and Concord and the Battle of Bunker Hill. We declare independence. Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence. We suffer at Valley Forge. We slog through this war that um, it really uh, tries men's souls. Eventually we win it's sort of at the miracle of Yorktown. And then we create this new nation, uh, unprecedented in the history of republics. It's virtually every person knows that story, David. And the question is then, how do you reflect upon that and all of its um, details after 40 or 45 years of spending virtually every day uh, reading about it and thinking about it? And so we have here this very senior American historian who is looking back over this incredible uh, achievement that he's made and trying to assess, he said at the end of today's program, so what's the story? You know, he's still asking what the story is of America. And I think at the moment I wanted to jump in right there and say, that's what we need to be talking about. You know, what is the story? Because I think we've lost our consensus as a people of what the story is. And I think that that's a spiritual civil war that's going on that's eating us alive. And I think that Joe Ellis is one of those people who's judiciously going back over all that he thought he knew and factoring in some new dynamics and new discoveries and trying to assess where are we as a people? Is this the worst moment or is this just another difficult moment where the founders uh, aggrandized beyond their merits? Were they truly an, uh, you know, a, a generation of, of, of heroic thinkers or is that a part of a mythology that we now need to shatter because of what we know about race and, and American Indians and so on? I think these are the questions that we need to be asking as a people. And to have someone as distinguished as Joe Ellis, he's not doctrinaire. He's not certain of what he thinks. He's wrestling with it after decades of writing about it. 
But to steal one of your phrases, I think you absolutely nailed it. And, you know, with, I, I don't want to come off as partisan in any way, but I, I kept reading that book and thinking, you know, the folks that were, say, demonstrating in the Capitol and causing the um, insurrection or whatever you want to call it on January 6th, they need to read this book and realize what it is they're messing with. This this is a book that gives you perspective and understanding, and at the end of it, you you have so much more of appreciation for what was achieved. With that, I, I think we should go to the show and let let folks hear hear Joe talk. Yeah, just one more comment. You know, you, you want to tear down the system and start thinking about what you want to put in its place, and the best way to prepare for that is to read. Uh, the work of people like uh, Dr. Joseph Ellis, uh, now at his undisclosed location in Vermont. Uh, David, lots coming up. People can go to the website for cultural tours, for books, for online courses, including the course on the Constitution. There's just so much that's going on. Um, and uh, we've had Lindsay Travinsky on, and we'll, she'll be back. We've had Joe Ellis on, and he'll be back. But I'm having a great time in this phase of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and I know you are too. So thanks to all of you who are listening. Support us if you can in any way that you can. But above all, keep listening and tell everyone you know. Let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week we are joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and a very special guest. And I will first say hello to you, Clay. Good to hear your voice, David, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. You know, I was reading Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, and at the end, uh, just before he uh, murders his wife, Desdemona, uh, Othello says, it is the cause, it is the cause. And I immediately thought of our friend Joe Ellis. And welcome to you, Joe. And the reason Clay thought that is because the book I have out, it's out there ready to be purchased, I'm told. It's entitled The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents. And I'm really both honored and uh, relieved to be talking to you because I've been talking to a lot of people on Zooms promoting the book over the last uh, couple of weeks. And I just feel more comfortable talking to you. And I know Clay's going to have questions and it's Jefferson will definitely be part of it because he's one of the main characters in the book. But Joe, you know, I, I invoked Othello. Your title invokes Freud's famous late tract civilization and its discontents. I know that was right. on purpose. Why? Because the American Revolution was a triumph in several senses of that term. We successfully beat, defeated the most dominant military power on the planet to achieve independence, which had never happened before. No colony had ever done that. Uh, and um, we uh, created the possibility of a nation-sized republic. Nobody's ever done that. We separated church and state. Nobody's ever done that. Those are pretty big deals. But at the end of the war, the two tragedies that are about to befall us were incapable of responding to slavery and putting slavery on the road to extinction and the indigenous people of, uh, of America, the just resolution of that. And so if you look for straight lines in nature, you'll never see them. And if you look for straight moral lines in American history, you'll never see them either because the triumphs and the tragedy seem to go together. And coming to terms with that is part of uh, my reason for the discontent section of the title. Let's go back to the beginning, if we might. Uh, the last time you were on the show, Joe, we talked about your new book, The Cause. In the beginning, in your introduction, you write, the pages that follow represent my attempt to tell the story of a highly compressed historical moment that subsequent generations called the American Revolution. No one called it that at the time. The British called it the American Rebellion, an accurate description of the eight-year war fought by former British colonists who sought to secede from the British Empire. And you, you really set things up in your introduction. I compliment you on that. But it wasn't regarded as the American Revolution. Well, it wasn't American in the sense that nobody thought of himself or herself as an American. They thought of themselves as New Englanders or Virginians or Pennsylvanians. The cause 
becomes the term they use, and the cause becomes a kind of verbal canopy or cover for a variety of interest groups, sectional, religious, ethnic people that don't have too much in common other than their commitment to independence from the British Empire. And so the cause has a radical agenda apart from independence. And Jefferson is the person who gives words to that radical agenda that become the magic words of American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words represent the political, ideological, and moral center of the cause and have implications. They have implications for women's rights. They have implications for the property qualification to vote. And they have implications for slavery. So the cause is a war for colonial independence with a radical or revolutionary agenda. Towards the end of your your introduction, you make a statement which gives me an opportunity to insert a question from a listener for the both of you. You write, no less an authority than George Washington observed at the end of, of the revolution that any historian who managed to write an accurate account of the war for independence would be accused of writing fiction. We got a a letter from Chris Dale wanting to know where that quote came from. He said he searched and searched and couldn't find it, Joe. It's in a letter between Washington and uh, Nathaniel Green uh, shortly after Yorktown in 1781. The, The second quote he asks about is something Jefferson wrote about how miserable he was in the presidency and how free he felt after he left office. Well, Jefferson wrote that in, in, a, in a letter at the end of his presidency and said, uh, I think he said, no prisoner released from his shackles felt more relief than I do. And this is, a, this is kind of what we would now call a trope. This is the Cincinnatus trope. Washington wanted to go home under his vine and his fig right. trees and, 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 and lead a simple agrarian life. And Jefferson could... Um, go way farther in, in this regard, this rhetoric, uh, than Washington and was always talking about how, how much he preferred life at Monticello um, where there was harmony and there was his garden and there were his fields and his books and his children and grandchildren. And Jefferson really seems to have meant it, and I think Washington meant it too, but they were also playing a, um, a game. This was part of the software that you had to run if you were a legitimate... <laughs> man of virtue. Jefferson made this comment, as you say, Clay, many times about the retirement. After he retired, uh, claiming he would never get back into politics again, um, John Adams said, why is it in Virginia all plants grow in the shade, predicting that Jefferson would run for president, which of course he did. The first four presidents of the United States, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison, never regarded the presidency as the capstone of their careers. They regarded it as a kind of epilogue. For Washington, the great achievement was winning the war. For Jefferson, writing the Declaration. For Adams, leading the Continental Congress towards independence before it was fashionable. And Madison, for moving us towards the Constitutional Convention. Um, so that in some sense, our view our view of the presidency is is elevated it didn't have the same significance for them in their own respective careers as it has subsequently. Let me ask a different kind of question just to to take this back. The more you look at this, the more remarkable it is that we actually did separate from Great Britain. Um, And I wonder, for example, if Washington had received his commission in the British Army, would he have essentially been assimilated sufficiently into the British hierarchy that he would not have joined the revolution? Impossible to answer. I think he still would have, sort of like Robert E. Lee for the Confederacy, decided to go with his home country. But if, in fact, we didn't have a Washington, if he, in fact, was on the other side, it's difficult to imagine how the American war could have succeeded. He, No other figure in American history was as crucial as Washington was. The disagreements about what the cause meant were profound, but everybody said, whatever it is, Washington symbolizes it. Washington is the epitome of it. 
Without him, the center would not hold because it wouldn't exist. Agreed. I want to go back just for a second to the kind of often debated endless issue of whether this was a true revolution or a rebellion or or a separation, as some people say. You know, Jefferson, in Notes on Virginia, said, and I think you remember this, the time for establishing every essential right on a firm and legal basis is now, while our people are honest and our our people are strong and our rulers are honest, from the end of this revolution, we shall be going downhill. And he thought that when this moment comes, when a social compact is shattered and um, allegiance to Great Britain is dissolved, and before we create state and national constitutions for the United States, we have effectively returned to what was called a state of nature. So we're in a state of anarchy. And now when we build this new legitimacy, these new state constitutions and a new national constitution, we have it in our power to do all sorts of things that were going to be extremely difficult to do uh, routinely. And so Jefferson believes that now's the time for decimal coinage. Now's the time to figure out how we're going to handle Western territories and new states. Now's the time for us to separate church and state. Now's the time for us to establish the widest white male franchise in human history. So in a sense, this interregnum, the shattering of the social compact, this return to a state of nature enabled us to to accomplish almost effortlessly all sorts of things that it's hard to believe we would have been able to make happen under a continuum of a colonial constitutional rule. What say you to that? It's uh, You reminded me of that. I should remember that, uh, Jefferson's thoughts on that. When he, A lot of that was when he was trying to rewrite the Virginia Constitution, too. There's a phrase that a uh, uh, now dead uh, Yale historian of some significance, David Bryan Davis, coined. It's an awkward phrase, but it relates, relates to your point. The phrase is, the perishability of revolutionary time. The perishability of revolutionary time. And what he's saying, and it, it echoes Jefferson's point, that we have a moment here, an extended moment, to do things that would be impossible to do otherwise, because we're in this transition, and we're in this compressed moment when if we do these things right, and we institutionalize these traditions and these governments, they can survive for some some time, although as in the end, he doesn't think it should be for more than a generation. But um, that there is a moment, and you see, what I would do is add slavery to that. There is this moment, and I think Jefferson fits into this moment. That's one of the, that slavery itself is going to end that we are committed to the cause which is incompatible with slavery is a vestige of the medieval world of witches and and bishops and cardinals and and that we're moving to a new point in time we're a laboratory for the rest of the world for the creation of a nation-sized republic and that that this is in Jefferson's reified way of thinking about it. You don't have to do anything; it's going to happen, and all you have to do is support it and and, and recognize it when it comes, and then sanction it. But it, there is this moment, and from I'm roughly saying from '76 to '83, '84, and the war is going on, of course. Uh, but that um, for at least for one brief moment, uh, Jefferson envisions. Um, an enlightened American nation-state that would be impossible to imagine earlier. Gentlemen, we need to take a short break from this conversation. We will return in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. We're so pleased this week to be joined by Professor Joseph Ellis talking about his new book, The Cause, and Clay Jenkinson, who didn't quite get a chance to respond to the questions about Jefferson and slavery. Do you want to pick that up, Clay? I do, because I think that Joe Ellis said something that's extremely important, particularly at this moment when Jefferson's reputation is in such decline and disarray to the point where Jefferson's statues in the city of New York are being plucked down, and there is serious talk about demolishing uh, the Jefferson Memorial in the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. I don't think that 
is like it's not going to happen. Uh, I oh, think Jefferson would be pleased to be removed from New York, which he would regard Albany as a source of corruption that he's glad to escape from. But that's just off the side here. My point about Joe's argument is this. I think it's a profound point that in that interregnum between the old order and the new, Jefferson believed that anything was possible. You know, agreed, the perishability of the revolutionary moment. And he wanted to install all these reforms while we could, because he knew that the continuum would soon reassert itself and things would become much harder at that point. And he also realized that the genius of America was going to be material happiness and that material happiness is not a revolutionary edge. And so he, slavery was on the table. And from 1776 until around 1786 or seven, Jefferson, I think, would have pulled the trigger and abolish slavery in the United States. You are on the target here. And, you know, and we're not apologists for Jefferson, even in the Jefferson hour. And we've been tough on him on occasion. But that if you're looking for a leader on the slavery issue, he's the best we have from about 74 to 75, at 85. In 74, he publishes this, uh, this pamphlet, summary view, in which he has a sentence and says, there's agreement among Virginia slave owners that slavery needs to end. And of course, the slave trade needs to end. That's like pulling that. Where, where did he get that? I don't know. But then when he writes the de- declaration, he changes Locke's trinity from life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness is an idea he gets from George Mason, but it by removing property, he removes the, the rationale that Virginia and Southern slave owners have to retain slavery. Remember, this is the whole issue on which the Civil War is going to be fought. I love that, and I agree 100% with that, that Jefferson meant it, that this wasn't just rhetorical flourishing. He wasn't just covering himself um, so that he appeared to be more of a lover of liberty than he was. I think he actually thought, this is our moment. Jefferson was a visionary, he was a dreamer, but he also was a hard-headed realist that knew that this was the moment and that moment will go away. But what happens, Joe, is that after around 1786, when he realized that this wasn't going to happen, that his fellow Virginians were not on board with him, that the country was not going to do the right thing on this, then there begins what I would call a very, very slow-motion tragedy for Thomas Jefferson, where there's he eventually becomes less committed to this. He becomes a little bit indifferent. He then starts to write things like, nobody is more willing than I am when the moment comes to do this, so we must look to our children and their grandchildren. And he starts to have a kind of hardening of his revolutionary arteries on this one question of racial emancipation. And you know, we look in vain for the fallout from this, but clearly, this is a tragedy for Jefferson, because look what it led to. In the year 2021, there is a significant portion of the enlightened world, the world Jefferson most wanted to be credited by, which finds him appalling and simply unacceptable because of this problem. And he knew this was going to catch up with him. He, he wanted to get it done. He couldn't get it done. And because of that, he became, by the end of his life, a pretty routine Southern protectionist. When the Missouri Compromise occurred in 18, 19, and 20, he actually argues for the extension of slavery into the territories. That's right. And he's going to disappoint at that point in time. And um, he fails to live up to his own ideals, but the ideals he asserts are the centerpiece of the civil rights movement and the reason why Martin Luther King, when he arrived at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August of 1963 to deliver the I Have a Dream speech, said, I've come to collect on a promissory note written by Thomas Jefferson. He's, he fails personally, but nationally he gave us the core of the American creed, and that should never be forgotten. I want to steer us back to the book, although I'm fascinated to hear the two of you talk about Jefferson and slavery. Back to your introduction, you write about a theme that continues to come up in your book, Joe. You say, in truth, Great Britain never had a realistic chance to win the war, despite its military and economic superiority. 
American victory was not a miracle. It was foreordained. How that end happened, however, was a function of chance, accident, and what Washington called providence. And you revisit that theme throughout. Right. Why Great Britain really never had a chance to win this war. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think it occurred to me that for the first time, Americans might be able to comprehend the dilemma that Great Britain faced in attempting to win the war against these uh, American bumpkins. Um, Think of it this way. Um, A newly arrived world power, uh, brimming over with confidence, having just obtained a third of a continent in the seven years or French and Indian War, a new British empire in North America, uh, with an economy and a military power unmatched by any European power, decides to commit to a war in North America that is both unnecessary and inherently unwinnable. I think we can recognize that story. Uh, You want to think Vietnam or you want to think Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, And the reason it's unwinnable is it's not a conventional war. It's a civil war, a war for hearts and minds as well. And unlike, say, Ireland or Scotland, which they were able to dominate, this is a continent. And this is a people spread up and down the Atlantic coast. And more importantly than that, and I I won't go on too long on this point because you could go on, at the local level, among ordinary Americans, the people that Jefferson believed were the soul of America, in every town, village, and hamlet in America, there's a series of committees created called Committees of Safety and Inspection. And no matter where you live, somebody would come to your house and ask you to sign a document committing yourself to the cause. And it was your neighbor. It might have been a a woman. It it might have been a relative. And if you don't sign, they'll say, well, give it some thought because I'll come back and it's important. And they'll come back in a week. And if you don't sign it, they'll say, I'm sorry, your name is going to appear in the newspaper as a person guilty of treason. You won't be able to go to church. You won't be able to buy groceries. You won't be able to do any things you might think about moving. And if you if you still don't come back at sign after another week or two, they'll come back and say it's time for you to leave because we're going to burn your house down. They're not going to kill you, but they're going to essentially force you. That what that does is it politicizes the entire American countryside. Probably 40 percent were for the resistance and the, the cause. 20 percent were against it. And another 40 percent wished it just go away. Well, that group of indifferent people could not remain indifferent. And that meant that the British could win every battle. But as soon as the battle was over and they left, the patriotic wave flowed over the town. And that's the reason whenever the British leave someplace, they have to take the loyalists with them. Because if they stay, they're not going to be killed, but they're certainly going to be ostracized. And that control of the countryside is the key that makes the war unwinnable for the British side. You you also write about how, yes, they could come in and control cities for a period of time, but the countryside, there was no way that they could control that. That's right. It's too vast. It's too vast. And, uh, but there, and, and, but that, that the British, the, the, before, well, let's see, soon after the declaration is, is made in July of 76, virtually every town, county, in America is under the control of the resistance. Um, It's something analogous to what we discovered in retrospect about Vietnam. And when we were escalated in 65, by the, just at the time we did that, subsequent CIA studies said that the VC controlled the entire countryside there too. And that the British military was an army of conquest. It was not an army of occupation. They didn't have an army big enough to occupy all of the United States. The entire British army was less than 50,000. They can only commit 30,000 to North America, and it would have taken over 100,000. And they could have stayed there forever, and it would have still ended up being a, you know, something that, that didn't go their way. So they really couldn't win the war, but... Towards the end, in 78, 79, 80, 81, the the support for the Continental Army is so low that, I mean, in terms of men and uh, money, that it almost dissolves. And while the British can't win the war, the Americans could lose it. And and, and so the, the latter years of the war are like a roller coaster. One of Jefferson's assumptions is what he called self government. 
and Clay can comment on this, that, that sort of means that more than sort of, it means that people internalize a sense of commitment to the collective. You don't have to have government do that. They do it themselves. Well, Washington would tell them, guess what? It doesn't work that way because nobody's willing to fight in the Continental Army. They're willing to fight for their local communities in the militia, but not join the Continental Army. And they're not willing to recognize the existence of a national government either, because that seems to them a foreign government. So that um, the Jeffersonian assumptions about human nature run afoul of people who aren't behaving the way Jefferson hoped they would. Just a couple of things about this, you know, why it was inevitable that we would win and the British would lose. One is that, um, you know, an island 3,000 miles away is going to have a very hard time maintaining, maintaining supply lines to a continent at the other end of the world. You know, subjugating Ireland was almost impossible for Britain, and yet it's only a, a few score of miles from the British coast. And so the supply lines were going to be ruinously expensive over time. And really, the, the, the claims against the war in the Parliament of England came about from fiscal conservatives who were watching the Treasury being bled to death by... Uh, trying to maintain the British occupation of, of the New World, but also you know it's a cliche, but it's true that the that the the occupied country we've just learned this only has to outlast the occupier. You, you win by not losing. That's Washington's key strategic insight. Namely, Washington is aggressive, and he sort of thinks of battle as a challenge to duel at the beginning of the war. He has to meet the enemy, General Howe, normally, and that's a mistake. Um, he needs to understand, and eventually does, that he doesn't have to win the war. All he has to do is not lose it. It's a lot easier to do that. And once he realized that, in some ways, the British cause was was lost. Yeah, look at look first at Vietnam. That by 1977, the North Vietnamese had taken the whole country, and look more immediately at Afghanistan. Within days of the U.S. departure, the Taliban was fully back in control. So there's that. And then finally, you know, the, the occupier does unspeakable things. So the occupier uses napalm. The occupier burns down a village in order to save it. The occupier, in the case of Britain in 1776, burns Norfolk to the ground. They crush the economy of Boston and the Bay Colony. And so the occupier does things that drive neutral or independent people into the arms of the rebels. This happens every time. We did it in Vietnam. Uh, we should have learned the lesson then. We didn't, and we certainly did it in Afghanistan, that every time you send a drone that miscarries and takes out a wedding party somewhere, you've created the next cadre of American-hating terrorists. And, and so the British behaved towards us as if they could come and spank us, and they couldn't, but they did enough damage to drive a lot of people into revolutionary muskets, don't you think, Joe? Yes, you did. I mean, in you know, the other city, like the city of what is now Portland, was burned to the ground with the use of cannon that had early versions of napalm, and 3,000 people were living there. And at some point in time, well, by 1778, when the French come in, boy, that really is the death knell for the British cause, because Britain now has to defend its whole empire, especially the Caribbean, and there's no way they can do that. At that point in time, it seems to me that the British... Well, the British send this Carlisle Commission over to say, okay, we're going to give you everything you said you wanted. You can tax yourselves, you can legislate for yourselves, we'll even let you have a Continental Congress, but you stay in the empire. And the response was, if you had made that offer in 1775 or 76, we would have surely taken it. But too many women have been raped. Too many towns have been burned down. Too many bodies on the battlefield have been bayoneted to death after wounded. The tragedies and the blood is just too high. And readers need to remember that the American Revolution was the second bloodiest war in American history per capita. More Americans died in the American Revolution than in any war save the Civil War. It wasn't the polite kind of etiquette-driven war that sometimes the painting seemed to, to make us think. After Bunker Hill, Jefferson said there could be no reconciliation when the British uh, troops bayoneted uh, wounded people on the field. Uh, and of course, bringing in German mercenaries didn't help the British um, propaganda machine very much either. Let me ask you a question from your book. 
it's about in, the intellectual infrastructure of communication and so on. So, you know, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, almost every American knew this within two or three hours. Uh, um, the, we had very, very weak communication infrastructure in 1776. How did the cause? My students used to think they had cell phones back. I mean, and, how, how did it? How did it happen? How did how did the word spread? It took six to eight weeks for something to move from one side of the Atlantic to the other, and if if you had to wait for a response, it meant like. 12 weeks to, to be able to respond so that people are living, I mean, time and distance, the distance is, is, is much more important than that it is now. And, and, uh, and it affected, uh, uh, the decision-making because people didn't know what had happened until long after it had occurred. Um, uh, so you're right about that. And when I teach students about this, I tell them, look, you're entering, a foreign country here, a different world. Um, the average American was born, lived out his or her life, and died within a three-day horse ride. Their perception of the world was local. Um, it took. They spent hours crafting letters. They didn't write emails. Um, it was assumed that disease was going to kill some of your kids, and, and the mortality rate, infant mortality rate, would be like twenty percent. So that. It's a it's a different world back there, and it, and when you go back to recover the history, if you're going to make judgments about their behavior, you've got to understand them first in their own terms, and all judgments can must await a recovery of their world rather than just an imposition of the values of ours. So, Joe, how do people in Charleston learn about the Boston Tea Party? How long does it take, and how do they learn this? You know, based on what we've been saying, it must have taken a long time, but it didn't take as long domestically because of newspapers. There were uh, 152 newspapers in the United States at the time, and the literacy rate in the United States was about 10 times higher than it was in Great Britain. Um, 90% among whales, uh, males in New England. And it, the, the speed with which the word went from Boston to Charleston was really remarkable. It was about a week before it would appear in a Boston paper, it would get picked up in Virginia, and that would get picked up in Charleston. Um, and newspapers were posted on taverns, and so 20 people would read one issue of the newspaper. Uh, pamphlets are an early form of uh, podcasts, and they were also people were reading them. And the the the, the combination, of the literacy rate, and the newspapers allowed for word to spread with really almost electronic speed in a, in a kind of pre-internet world. It's time for us to take a short break from our conversation with the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Joseph Ellis, about his new book, The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. You'll know from those dogs barking that we have Joe Ellis with us today from his undisclosed location somewhere in the green mountains of the state of Vermont. Joe, you've been doing some readings from your book and, and signings, and most of it's been electronic. What's what, what are the kinds of questions you're getting from the public about the cause? People are interested in how at the local level these things worked. People are also interested in why didn't they support the Continental Army? Why was the Continental Army so suspect? People are also interested in the certain characters that I have in the in the book that are major characters at the time, but have sort of dropped out of this mainstream story that they've not heard of. I mean, Nathaniel Green, was he really that good? Yes, he was the most important tactician and the best military tactician in the Continental Army. This guy, Robert Morris who has been de demonized in a lot of the scholar literature, really is a person who saves the day with his own money to get troops moved and to get the soldiers paid their pension. And the way in which the Continental Army was treated at the end of the war, they were, and here's the, they come back from a victorious war, a battle or a victorious war, and they're, they're demonized in their towns because people think they're going to cost them money because they're going to have to pay for their, their uh, retirements. And, uh, those are some of the things that they talk about. But Jefferson is going to have a hard time with your thesis. That uh, I'm sure he's aware of it, but 
he's going to pretend that it's not so, that, that local people had to be kind of bullied and intimidated into joining the cause. Jefferson's view is uh, the George III and the Parliament did these awful things, and then the American people spontaneously rose up and demanded an equal respect for their rights, and that nobody had to intimidate anybody. I think you're right, although I think Jefferson's explanation seems to work briefly at the moment when we declare independence. There really is a kind of collective commitment there that's visible in what the manifesto say from the different counties and states. But it's not lasting. You know, the Jefferson's value system is temporarily true, but it's good for a sprint, but it's not good for a marathon. And the war becomes a marathon. And as that happens, patriotism doesn't die. It recedes to the local level. And support for the army and support for a larger definition of the causes is, is non-existent. And, and, and at the end of the war, we're not a nation. In that sense, Lincoln's wrong in the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation. No, they didn't. We're still a confederation of sovereign states. The Jeffersonian utopian view is temporarily good, but not enduring. Joe, you were talking about uh, answering questions from people who came to your book signings and the things they wanted to know. Uh, I really found this book as... There's so many books that have been written about this period of history, and you've written a lot of them, as as we know. But this book seemed to give sort of a understanding of, of what was going on. So it's not just the events, but why this happened and how this occurred. Uh, most of your books, not all of them, but most of your books are biographies, the ones people know. You know Adams some, or Washington or Jefferson. Yeah, right. Some people think I'm a presidential historian because I've written about the first three presidents. And I'm not really that. But This is a bit of a departure from that. I mean, it's it's more of an overall history. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, I was accused of being a biographer, which is fine by me, uh, but... Um, you do slip into that, something that I really enjoyed, which you have these little inserts called profiles, where you talk about characters that obviously you thought deserved a little more attention or were very interesting. People who they wouldn't think are in the story, but are, it's like Katie Green is Catherine, is, uh, Catherine Green is Tanda Green's wife, and she's the angel of Valley Forge. That was great. And, uh, I didn't know a thing about her. Yeah, and to recover her role there, yeah, you know, walking through Valley Forge in the snow with her evening gown on and singing to the troops and listening to them, some of them as they're dying and reading to them. Um, also, um, Harry Washington, who is Washington's slave, who flees to the British Army and ends up back in uh, first in Nova Scotia and then in Africa. And his story is, is nobody knows his story. But I think that if I try to contextualize my own project here, I, I started 30 years ago to write about the American founding. And you're right, I, I began it biographically, like, let's recover these people called the founders. And I began with two assumptions. One is that they weren't mythical heroes. Apparently, new nations need mythical heroes, but they're not. They're real people. And that means they're, they're flawed just like us. And if they weren't flawed, what in heaven's name would we have to learn from them? On the other hand, once you discover your father was really guilty of uh, all kinds of crimes uh, or all kinds of misbehavior, you, he goes the other way. And and uh, no, 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 they are the greatest generation of political leadership in American history. And so, yes, they're they're flawed, but they're great. And in fact, when you talk about the founders, people mean that there's a single thing called the founders. They're not. They all disagree. And that's part of the secret of their success. There's a kind of built-in checks and balances, not just in the Constitution itself, but in the framework of the founders, the, the, that, G, that generation. And as Clay will know, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of the Adams-Jefferson correspondence at the end of their lives because they are two different, the North and South Poles of the American Revolution who don't agree about what they had done. But the, the book is should have been the first volume in my history of the founding. And it turns out to be the last volume. But I bring to it stuff and knowledge that I wouldn't have had if I'd started writing it in the chronological order because I've read the Washington Papers, the Adams Papers, the Jefferson Papers, most of the Franklin Papers, all of the Madison Papers, most of the Hamilton, oh, all the Hamilton Papers. Hamilton it had the good grace to die young, so those papers aren't that much. Um, it is my effort to try to say this is the beginning of a story. This is how the story starts. 
this is how we get to later the nation and later the creation of this enduring republic and then democracy under Jackson. And at this stage in my life, I need to know whether I can still do it. And uh, I hope the answer is yes, because uh, my question is, what's the story? And uh, my audience isn't just other historians. My audience is intelligent people interested in history and want to learn more. You know, there's one other observation I have to make about your book that I really appreciated and enjoyed. And that was the effort you made to bring some of the important women during this time to the forefront, particularly Abigail Adams, Mercy Otis Warren. And I didn't realize that the two of them were such close friends. I I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. And Katie Green in there, too. Uh, And to give you the Katie Green story, Katie uh, retires to uh, to Georgia, where Nathaniel Green has been given plantations for his successful conduct of the Southern Campaign. He dies of sunstroke in 1786. She's got four kids, and she writes to the president of Yale um, to say, can you send me a tutor down here to help me with my kids? This is outside of Savannah. And they send down um, Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney comes down, and, and together, she, she, Katie, and Eli Whitney invent the cotton gin. And uh, so, like, she's an incredible person. They've got a story that, that comes on after the war. And there's a moment uh, in one of the winter encampments when she goes up to Washington and asks him to dance, and she's a gorgeous woman. And, uh, and they dance for an hour, and people are starting to murmur, you know, like, what's this going on here? And Martha leans over and says, don't worry, George and I think of her as our daughter. Later on, when Washington is president, she comes to a levy, and Washington is extremely formal and everything, and he bows and to, to, to people coming in. And when she comes in, she he grabs her and hugs her, and it's the only time that Washington's ever seen giving emotion to somebody else, because she was she was the angel of. In Valley Forge, they thought of themselves as the few, the survivors, and she was one of the few. Well, whatever Martha Washington was. She wasn't uh, the sensual um, epitome of of Washington's dreams. (laughs) Well, let's not start a rumor here 200 years too late, but um, uh, but Katie's worthy of your attention, and if I did bring her to your attention, uh, David, I'm pleased. Uh, My only point is that Washington liked these sprightly women. He loved to dance with women. He loved the attention of women. He loved female admiration, and um, it's clear that he had that he couldn't unbend much in his life, but he could unbend when he was in the presence of, of attractive and, and intelligent women. Towards the end of the book, you um, invoke the words of Abigail Adams again, lamenting that her husband faced the awkward task of representing an American government that did not exist. And it seems that even at that time, Congress had a pretty low uh, level of approval that she referred to them as beardless boys who thought that foreign affairs referred to infidelity abroad. She's great. Isn't she great? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're representing the United States at Britain at the court of St. James, and there's no central government for them to represent, really. Um, one of my favorite lines is... Um, Abigail's sister asks her late later in life uh, whether she would do it again with John, and she says, "I cannot imagine suffering with anyone else." Um, she's something. She's something. She really is. You also write that uh, Jefferson concurred with Abigail's assessment of his new colleagues in Congress, saying, "The members of Congress are no longer, generally speaking, men of worth or distinction." That is right. The kind of people that were there in 76, that's which they're comparing them to, no longer are there. They're down in the states now. And it, and it's like us looking at the Senate now and saying the people in the Senate no longer represent any kind of political elite, a real uh, a body that deserves its reputation as, the, as a great uh, debating society. It's, uh, I think it, uh, their highest priority is only to be reelected, I'm afraid. And... Um, that they're looking at the people representing Americans and saying that they're not worthy. Well, as as we come to a a close shortly here in the conversation this week, I will say that I enjoyed this book very much, and I would heartily recommend it to Jefferson Hour listeners. It's, it's as I say, a great bedrock of knowledge about 
what happened and why it happened, and we could talk on and on for hours about it, but it's it's a great read, and I congratulate you, sir. I care a lot about whether it's a good read. I spend Most historians spend about uh, three quarters of their time doing the research and one quarter of their time writing. I spend about an equal amount of time because somebody comes up and says, oh, I think that was a great paragraph. It must be great to be able to write that kind of thing. And I say, that took two weeks. And, um, and so if readers find it to be a good read, that's very, very important to me. Joe, let me ask you one last question. Um, when you started all this 30 or 40 years ago, you were a young Turk and filled with your own ambition and energy, and you had a sense from your graduate hard reading about American life and the revolution and the early national period. Now, a lot has happened since then, and a lot has happened to you and to all of us since then. As you look back now, do you feel a, a disillusionment with how you saw things then, an evolution? How do you how do you assess our tarnished republic then and now from the position of having for 30 or 40 years thought hard about this? Mm. I don't think I've gone through a, a dramatic change, but I think I've been, there's been an evolution in which what I expect of the past, I now, I've always been given to irony and paradox. Um, but when we look back, we should expect to find both triumphs and tragedies, both um, both great achievements and great burdens. And the burdens are now afflicting us in a way, especially on the race issue, in a way that can't be ignored. Um, but that the, the American narrative is not morally, not morally um, correct or that, that, that I'm impressed with my imperfection and of human imperfection. Uh, and it doesn't mean I have no expectations. I do about the future of the Republic. I think we'll get through this. And the reason I think we'll get through it is because in some ways, both in 1776 to 83 and from 1861 to 1865, we faced even greater challenges and got through them. So I'm not pessimistic, um, but I'm, um, I'm seasoned. Spoken like a man who gave a significant portion of his life to the work of John Adams. <laughs> so Joe, I want to ask you about this. So you know, Jefferson's uh, reputation is in disarray. Uh, Adams is up. Hamilton is was up for a time. He's sort of slipping back now. Um, Washington uh, looks better than he has in a long, long time. This is what happens. These are the vicissitudes of historiography and the national mood. But where do you see this heading? Does this does this sort of uh, almost radical reevaluation of the founding generation and everything else does it even itself out? Does the pendulum reach uh, an end point here? Do we cheer up, or is the are we really headed towards a much starker, darker view of our founding? I don't think it can be a darker, a completely dark view. Um, if you want a scene that gives me confidence. I remember, and I put it in my mind in a permanent way as a picture, the entry of the American Olympic team to the stadium at Tokyo during the Olympics this past summer. The American Olympic team was the only truly multiracial team in the entire world. Um, and that's the future. That's who we are. Um, and... Uh, and, and even Jefferson, I'd like to believe, I mean, you can't bring him back, uh, but one of his dominant values is that every generation needs to reinvent itself. And I believe and that even Jefferson himself would have been able to see that that's who we are and that's who we, uh, that's where our future lies. And um, it, that it's obvious that that is going to be difficult for pe some people in America to, to come to terms with. And um and we've never had a dem we've had demagogues in America before, but we've never had one that was president of the United States. Um, I think we'll get through it, um, uh, but um, uh, that everything is complicated, and 
to the extent that politically correct colleagues believe it's simple um, and that it's easy to find villains and heroes. It's not. Um, and I've had to come to terms with some of my own imperfections. And so I now like to think of myself as the historian of imperfection. And uh, join me as we understand our sins and overcome them. Hear, hear. Thank you, Professor Joseph Ellison. Congratulations on your new book, The Cause. As always, sir, we wish you well and look forward to your return. David, a wonderful conversation with the returning champion. After a considerable absence, Mr. Joseph Ellis, now his book, The Cause, is out and about and getting very strong support from around the country. And we're glad to be able to talk about some of its themes here on the Jefferson Hour. Joe, it's always a thrill to have you on this program, and we count on your wisdom to help us wade through this morass that we seem to be in in the early 21st century. We'll see you all next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>